At first, the Ford cars were pretty much like all the others. They were expensive and not much good outside the city. Although the company prospered, Henry Ford was dissatisfied. He was a country boy and he had a dream inside his head of a small, light, rugged car that a farmer could use on the rough roads of the hinterland. He knew how badly the farmer needed such a car. He kept working away at the idea, and by 1908, he had it licked. It was called the Model T. the farmer saw this car, he knew it was for him. But there was just one thing wrong with it. It still cost too much. Back at the plant, Henry Ford tried to figure some way he could bring the cost of his Model T down. He watched the men in the plant as they moved from car to car, assembling them a piece at a time. And he thought, it takes too long to put a car together this way. That's what keeps the price up. One morning, he told a foreman to tie a piece of rope onto a chassis and start pulling it across the floor. As it moved past, each workman put on a different part. principle of mass production was born, the moving assembly line. It was to become one of the most important industrial developments of the 20th century. Now the cars move past the men in a steady, unending procession, growing part by part as they move. And the main assembly line was fed by smaller sub-assembly lines that flowed into it, all perfectly timed and synchronized, so that every part was delivered to exactly the right place at the right second. system of assembly, Henry Ford achieved the end he had been working for. The price of the Model T dropped from $850 to $450. Now everybody could have one. Henry Ford changed the whole social structure of the United States with the Model T. As the cars poured off the assembly line, the people who bought them began to set up a great clamor for better roads. And soon every state in the nation was building new highways. And along every road ran the Model T. It became the popular symbol of that early automobile era. The Model T put the nation on wheels. isolation of the farmer and made the Sunday ride a national institution. 
and it finally broke down the age-old barrier between two different ways of life, the city and the country. But the Model T was more than an American phenomenon. Almost from the beginning, it had an international appeal. Manufacturing centers were set up in Canada and Great Britain. Assembly plants and sales outlets sprang up around the world. Soon you could see the Model T's characteristic profile in the streets of Cairo. It penetrated the jungles of India and the cities of Malaya. It appeared in the streets of Paris and the chug of its sturdy engine echoed from the pyramids, disturbing the long sleep of Egyptian pharaohs. Mexican bullfighters rode in it, and the people of Africa welcomed it too. On the Australian belt, where the mule had been harnessed but had shown no particular enthusiasm for work, the sturdy Model T took over. People all over the world who knew no other English learned to say Ford. It was an American ambassador that earned respect wherever it went. The originality of Henry Ford's mind expressed itself in almost everything he did, and the magnitude of his concepts was often startling. In 1914, he announced that the Ford Motor Company would share $10 million with its employees, lower the nine-hour workday to eight hours, and double the minimum wage to $5 a day. These ideas were front page news when they were first proposed. Henry Ford was well ahead of his time. Ever since his youth, Henry Ford had dreamed of taking the burden of work off the back of the farmer and putting it on the machine. This dream led him to experiment with tractors. It was tractors like these that helped England avert a critical food shortage during the First World War. And even before an American army landed in France, the Model T was there, lurching through mud and shell holes bringing the wounded back from the front line. Henry Ford hated war, but once it came, he did everything he could to help win it. that followed the First World Conflict was only a brief interval between wars. Having helped to create the League of Nations in the hope of ending war, Woodrow Wilson could not persuade the United States to join it. By the mid-twenties, the Ford Motor Company had grown into a huge industrial complex with the Rouge plant at its center, and its international development was continuing. The Ford plants, already established in Belgium and Holland, were doing well. In England, the ground was broken by Edsel Ford for a new plant at Dagnum on the Thames, a project that Henry Ford and his old friend Lord Perry had been planning for many years. enterprises were industrial. About this time, he created a great museum at Dearborn, Michigan. He believed that the culture and progress of America could best be shown through the ways in which people used to live and work. His museum preserves the various articles ingeniously fashioned by man to better his environment, from the time of the first settlers almost to the present day. Crude machines and hand tools, 
primitive engines. The engine he had made himself and tried out on the kitchen sink. Here, too, are nearly 100 historic American buildings carefully transplanted to his museum and Greenfield Village. Edison's Laboratory from Menlo Park, New Jersey. The Bicycle Shop from Dayton, Ohio, where the Wright brothers first conceived the principles of powered flight. And the little workshop on Bagley Avenue in Detroit, where Henry Ford built his quadricycle. By the early 30s, storm clouds were gathering in Europe once again. In the United States, a Great Depression was crippling the nation. Ford's answer to bad times was to keep producing. In 1932, the company put out a new model, its first V8, ensuring employment for thousands who otherwise might have been jobless. Then the brief interval of peace was shattered. The world would long remember what happened in Paris, London, Pearl Harbor, Dunkirk. It would remember the undaunted. Cologne, Berlin, Hiroshima. The end of the war marked the beginning of a new era. Some called it the Atomic Age but there were other developments almost as significant as nuclear fission. It was the electronic age. The space age. In the hundred years since Henry Ford was born, how the world has changed. One of the greatest instruments of change has been the motor car. Urban as well as rural areas are being reshaped to accommodate the tremendous pressure of modern traffic. Modern highway systems are creating new patterns across landscapes all over the world. Henry Ford's revolutionary idea of the moving assembly line was not limited to the manufacture of motor cars. It was a magic formula which could be adapted to every field of mass production. Wherever it was used, it lowered the price of consumer goods, putting them within reach of everyone. And with greater productivity came greater well-being and more leisure for the average citizen. People all over the world began to enjoy a better life than their forefathers had ever dreamt of. Henry Ford did not live to see all of it. In 1947, the man who had contributed so much to a century of progress finally died. He did not need a monument to be remembered. As we look back at the world in which Henry Ford lived and worked, we can clearly see how much we owe to those remarkable men who, in every generation, contribute so greatly to human welfare. Our progress is given continuity by men like Henry Ford men who see the shortcomings and needs of their time 
and venture forth with courage and enterprise to change their world and make it better for all men.